Welcome and good morning to the Awesome to God Christian Church. I stand before you this morning like I do anytime I'm able to stand before you. First and foremost, thank you for joining us and thankful that God has chosen me on this morning. So with that being said, I want to speak not long, but I will forewarn you, we will be in our Bible this morning, flipping quite a bit. Uh, I am involved in a program called Christian Evangelism Fellowship, and it works with the school-age kids, mostly uh, grade school kid children, and mostly the younger children. Um, and I had an opportunity uh, at one of our Tuesday sessions uh, this message came from a young lady who I was sitting, she was at my table, we were assigned, we were going over our uh, Bible verses and, and going over our story, and she wasn't saying much. She was very quiet, and uh, she was a little shy young lady, and about 45 minutes in, she looks up at me, and she says, so, why are you here? And with that this morning, I want to speak from the title, Why Are You Here? And I want to discuss it from the, the aspect of Jesus ran into a similar question. And so the young lady, after a while, for whatever reason, she was, she was shy, but she was also inquisitive because in her mind, it was she thought it strange that I would be there singing, dancing, playing games, and talking to, I guess in her mind, talking to young kids, most of them are between, I would say, first and fourth grade, why would I be spending my time uh, with them? So she just asked the question, and she looked very longingly and very inquisitively into my eyes and said, so why are you here? As if I had some ulterior motive or something was wrong, or maybe it was based on her past relationships that she just thought it was strange that you would have somebody who is not a teacher, who's not a principal, uh, who is not even, for that matter, involved in um, what we would, I guess, consider primary education, uh, volunteer or take their time to come and spend time with them. So this morning I wanna, I wanna talk about that, and we're gonna be in some scripture, we're gonna be flipping this morning, but I think Jesus encountered a similar question. People, when he came, people have some questions about, well, why did he come, why are you here? And so, there are a couple reasons that, that, that we want to talk about that Christ came. The first one, though, um, why he was here and why he came here is the Lord Jesus Christ emphasized the purpose in which he came and, and he did not come. So let's talk about why he did not come. So let's talk about why he did not come first. And the first place I'd like to turn to is Matthew chapter 9. And we'll read verses 9 through 13. And it reads... And, he, and as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of customs. And he saith to him, follow me. And he arose and followed him. And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at the meat in the house, behold, many pelicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with pelicans and sinners? And understand here uh, that pelicans were tax collectors, and we'll talk about why they were looked look down upon. And so they asked him, Why do you sit with the pelicans and sinners? And in verse 12 it says, But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, they that behold need not a physician, they that are sick. So in essence, he said, well, you know, if you're, if you're not sick, you don't need a physician. And in verse 13, he said, he goes further, he says, but go ye and learn what that means. So he told them that, and he says, go learn what that means. And then he says, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but the sinners, or sinners to repentance. And so understand what is occurring here is they are questioning why Jesus, you know, if, if this is the Messiah, is what they were questioning. They say, well, why is he hanging out with the tax collectors 
and the sinners. And understand at the time, the Jewish people frowned upon and looked down upon the tax collectors because they were not only were they taxing the people as was the law and, and under the rule of Caesar, but also these tax collectors were had been known to um, overcharge the people. So they were not only just taxing the people, and so they were kind of making up their own uh, charges or their own uh, tax laws as they went and uh, their own amount. So it'd be no different today than if, uh, if we left it up to companies or businesses to determine what percentage or what the, what the tax um, deductions and percentages were. And we understand that if we really did that, we know now that the, the federal government, the federal law tells us uh, based on income levels, it determines what percentage of tax we must pay. And so we don't leave that just up to somebody just willy nilly. Um, if we go out here to one of the, the tax preparers, they don't just get to make that up. It's kind of set by law. So at that time, um, Caesar had, they knew that they had to pay taxes, but oftentimes they would take advantage of people and charge them more than what Caesar was even asking. So Jesus understands that and he is dining. He's, he's being around, he's meeting with these people, but all he has around him are these tax collectors who are taxing their own Jewish people. That's why they hated them so much. Because they said, well, it's one thing for you to, you know, be taxing and, and, and be subservient to Caesar. But it's another thing to tax or be overtaxing your own people. So they, they, they really felt some type of way about tax collectors. And then also sinners, we understand what the context there is. But those are the people that Jesus was meeting with. So these Pharisees, these leaders... We're asking, well, this, you know, what is, who, if this is Jesus, this is their Savior, why is he around sinners? So he explains to them that um, in, the, in the second part of verse 13, he says, For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners, or sinners to repentance. So understand that he is really telling us here, why, one reason he did not come, he did not come to call the righteous. And he made that very clear to them there. Let's go to the book of John. And if you flip in John, uh, I want to want to want to pick up. I want to read another reason he he tells them again why he did not come. John chapter three, verse seventeen, and it says, and this is Jesus speaking in my Bible. It's in the red. It says, "For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might." saved. So another reason that Jesus came, we understand now that he did not come to call the righteous. And I always think of, just going back a minute, I always find that interesting because it's, it's almost an oxymoron in the terms of we understand that none are righteous but through him, or made righteous but through him. So when he says, I come not to call the righteous, I often chuckle a bit about that because what that is implying to me is some people feel like whether they know Jesus Christ or not, some people are so uh, high on the hall or think so highly of themselves that they think they're already righteous. And so he says, I don't come to call them. And so at that point, if you think you're righteous and the only way you can be made righteous is through Jesus Christ, but you feel like you're righteous, he's right. He did not come and he has not come for you because you're not going to accept him anyway. Because you already think you're righteous. So we know he did not come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. Then he tells us here in John 3.17, he tells us that he came not to condemn the world, but that the world through him may be saved. So once again, he reminds us here that he came not to condemn the world, but save the world. He came not to call the righteous, but to call the sin sinners into repentance. So he lets us know that. The other reason he lets us know, he says, I did not come. For another reason, because he was questioned multiple times about this, he lets us know in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, he tells us this. He says, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. 
And so oftentimes you hear people quote, I came not to condemn the law, but fulfill the law. And they're speaking uh, from this precept here and as we find in the scriptures. And he tells us here, he warns us. He says, think not that I am come to destroy the law. And so we understand that if you understand and you study your scripture, it's no way Jesus would have ever come to destroy the law because he speaks and the Bible speaks of, of times and warns us against lawlessness. So if he came to condemn the law and get rid of the law, that would be a he would be encouraging lawlessness. And that, that was not the that was not the intent. And he says, or the prophets. So he wanted to make sure and be very clear that he did not come to destroy the laws. And in this case, understand what he's talking about here is um, there were a lot of laws um, and commandments and laws went there. But one of them here, the Jewish uh, under the mitzvah had 613 laws that they were to um, adhere to. And so he, he tells them, you know, because not all the laws are bad. Even today, some people... Uh, encourage or, or talk about lawlessness, but understand that we we don't ever want to we don't ever want to get to a point where we don't want to uh, abide by any laws. We we truly, as we, we say it, um, I don't think people would like it if we truly embraced living under free rule uh, where there were no laws. So I don't think anyone encourages that. Neither did Jesus Christ. So He says, "I come not to condemn the law or the prophets." So are those who are in some in some ways even supporting or encouraging law are those who are administering the law. And in this case, we understand that he's really speaking here to the Jewish leaders. So he says, I come not to condemn the law, nor the people that are administering it, nor the people that are, are speaking and using the laws or the word as their um, guide. So he says, I come not to destroy that. He says, I come not to destroy, but to fulfill. And understand, that's why we say he, uh, Jesus came not to condemn the law, but fulfill the law. It's because he was the only one that was perfect enough to be able to meet all the criteria of the law. And he understands that us as common men cannot do it. So he came to fulfill the law. He came to be the one who could answer the bell on all accounts. So he tells us, he didn't come to call the righteous. He tells us he didn't come to condemn the world. And he tells us he didn't come to abolish the law or the prophets. There's one other reason he tells us that he did not come. And that can be found in the book of Mark. So flip, if you would, to the book of Mark, chapter 10, verse 45. And here's what it says here. Once again, Jesus is speaking. It's in the red. He says, For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and not to give his life, and, and to give his life a ransom for many. So understand that Jesus tells us here he came not to be ministered to. In other words, he understands here that he came to minister not to be ministered to. So um, I know oftentimes in our churches, and I see we find ourselves certain times, it almost appears the people that um, have been called by God, it almost seems like they get more be, they get ministered to more than they minister sometimes. And so Jesus understands, he, he makes that very clear. He says, I come not to be ministered unto, but to minister unto. And then he says, and to give his life for a, ra a ransom for many. So understand here that Jesus lets us know that he came to serve, but what he did not come to do is be served or be ministered to. The other thing I think Christ tells us, and, and Jesus tells us very clearly is, why did he come? He came because it was the Father's will. And the scripture tells us this. If you would flip to the book of John, as the young lady mentioned, she said, why are you here? Or why was Jesus here? Well, he came for a couple of reasons, but one thing we also just talked about why he did not come. So now let's talk about why he came. He was very clear about that. In John chapter 6, verse 38, he tells us very clearly. He says, For I come down from heaven, not to do my own will, 
but the will of him who sent me. So understand Jesus came from heaven and we know if we tie it all together, we know that God, or Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And this verse tells us, for I came down from heaven. Well, we understand and know from the foundation of who resides in heaven. So he says, I came down from heaven not to do my own will. So understand, he was sent here on divine assignment to do the will of him who sent me. And the only him that could have sent him is none other than God the Father. So understand that Christ came because it was the Father's will. Let's go to now John 7, 28. He shed some more light. He says this, Then cried Jesus in the temple as he taught, saying, Ye both know me, and ye know whence I am, and I am not come of myself, but he that sent me is true, whom ye know not. So understand that once again here, he is making it very clear why he came here. He came here on the accord of the Father, not his own initiative, and not his own accord. And that's why Jesus constantly would tell people, I'm here to do my father's business. He came here because it was the will of the father. And when the young lady asked me um, on that day, she said, well, why did you come here? Or why are you here? And I told her it was to share the word of Jesus Christ with those kids. And Jesus was kind of the same way. He was very clear. If you ask him why he was come or why he was there, he let you, he made it very clear. He said he was doing the will of his father. Let's go to John 3, uh, let's go to John 4.34. Just a few pages back. Once again, he, he explains it to us when they asked. And Jesus speaking here, it says, Jesus saith unto them, my meat is is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. He was here on divine assignment from his father, none other than God. And so Jesus made it very clear why he came. Let's go to, just since we're already here, just flip back a page, probably a two in your Bible, in John 3.16, he, he made it clear, most of us know the scripture, it's a very popular one. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So understand, Jesus makes it very clear that God so loved the world. He came from the Father, in this case, God. Lastly, let's talk, last scripture about this. John, flip back over, to, if you could flip over to John uh, chapter 5, verse 30. Once again, he's speaking and answering questions. He says this, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. Once again, Jesus explaining here, Jesus talking, he wanted to make it painfully, obviously clear that it was, he was here as the result to do the will of the Father. And so Jesus, as, 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 he, as people are marveling, as he's, he's doing miracles, he brings them back to, he comes back to this. I can do nothing of my own self. Nothing, he says. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father. So understand here that when Jesus was walking around and he was teaching and he was calling some things out that weren't being done correctly, 
he let it be known that it wasn't just him of, of his own will doing what he wanted, but he was doing it under the instruction of the Father. So he lets them know that I hear, so I'm hearing what's going on, I judge, and my judgment is just. So he says when he whatever he was doing, it was just, but it wasn't just because of who he was. He says what I'm doing is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father. Because we know, and the scriptures tell us, whenever we do things on our own will, unfortunately, because of our filthy, sinful nature, we, oftentimes, if we try to only do things on our own accord, we can easily be led astray and kind of, which is what happened to the, the, the what, we, what you read about here is what happened to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the, the leadership of the Jewish community. They had high power, high authority. They were supposed to be the ones administering the law. But what we know and what we learn is they had started uh, playing with the law and, and picking and choosing and they kind of started not being just. And we understand if we know nothing else by reading this book, by reading the Bible, that God is a just God. And so Jesus even makes it known here that even he couldn't administer or adjudicate things justly if he was on his own accord. But understand that he would tie everything back to the will of the Father. The other thing that I think the scriptures tell us why Jesus came, why, did, why, is, why is he here, is... I think Jesus tells us, and we're going to read it here, he says he came to fulfill the scripture. He came to do what his father had promised. Let's go to Luke chapter 18. And let's read, um, we'll start Luke 18, we'll go back to Matthew. Let's go Luke 18 verses, I mean, I'm sorry, Luke 4 verses 18 through 20. So Luke 4 18 through, we might do 20, we might stop at 19. So let's go Luke chapter 4. We know we're going to start at 18. Let me see where we, where we end up. Luke 18, I mean I'm Luke 4, chapter uh, verse 18, and I think we're going to just read 18 and 19. And this is what it says, Jesus speaking here once again, and he is teaching in Nazareth. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted. And then it goes on to say, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set liberty to them that are abused. And in verse 19 it says, to teach the acceptable year of the Lord. So he lets us know here that he came to fulfill the, the scriptures because God had promised his people that he was going to do these things. And understand that Jesus came, not like we said, on his own free will, but understand he came to fulfill the promises that God had made to his people. So let's go back here into Matthew. I think he makes it clearer once again. Go to Matthew chapter 11. And as, as I promised, we will be flipping today because I think it's important for you to understand. We, I think sometimes we take for granted that everyone just understands what Jesus came for. And then uh, I think we say, well, that's just basic. That's simple. We all know. But fundamentally, I, I, when you know, as, as what that young lady said, it kind of struck a chord with me. Understand some people don't have a relationship or didn't grow up in the church or no one ever talked to them about Jesus. So when you get a name of Jesus... You just assume that everyone knows why he came or knows what, what it's about. And we, we, we can't be um, we can't be that forward in our thinking that we, we can't go back and say, you know what, well, maybe some people don't know. And so we have to teach them. And then sometimes we assume that some people that talk about Jesus Christ, do they even know? So we got to go back. we got to be basic sometimes and go back to the ground floor. And uh, Matthew chapter 11. Verse uh, 3 through 6. We'll start at 3, read through 6. It says this, And he saith unto him, Art thou 
he that should come, or do we look for another? So understand what's happening here. They are asking, in this case, John, John Baptist is asking, hey, is, is, are you the Messiah? Are you the one? And Jesus, in verse 4, it says, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have, or have the gospel preached to them. And, and this is verse uh, 6, and blessed is he whoever shall not be offended in me. So understand here, they're asking questions, are you it? And all he takes them back to is what did the scripture say? What did the scripture tell us the Messiah would look like? What did it say our, our Savior would look like? And so Jesus just points them back to, go back to your book. What did your scripture say? And he says, pretty much he's asking them, watch and see, and haven't I already done some of these things? So he came to fulfill the scripture. Let's go to John uh, John chapter 1 really quickly. John chapter 1 verse 11. Even in the book of John, John even gives us some insight. John 1 verse 11. Jesus once again explaining, why, what are you doing here? What's going on? In John 11, uh, John 1 verse 11, it says this. He came unto his own and his own received him not. So understand that Jesus came here, and the scriptures told us that, because the, the Old Testament scriptures told us that the Jewish people would, would call on other gods, would go against God. So, understand God, and this is when we get into the Jews and the Gentiles, it tells us here in the scriptures, he says he came unto his own. So he came specifically for the Jews, because that's what the Old Testament promised. But then it says this, and his own received him not, which the scriptures in the Old Testament told us was going to occur. And for many of us, that's why we have an opportunity to have a relationship with our father today. It's because he came to fulfill the scripture, which talks about that the Messiah was going to come. And we understand that the Messiah came and gave a whosoever will call. Whoever would like to come and, 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 and accept him, come. And we, we read back on the other scripture, talk about be offended, not if you're not offended, if Jesus didn't offend you, if you weren't offended by him, he allowed you an opportunity to be joined once again with the Father. Lastly here, uh, before we move on, let's go to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 8, and let's see what it tells us. In Acts chapter 8, we're going to start at verse 30. It says this. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understand thou what thou readest. And he said, How can I accept uh, some man should guide me. So how can I understand except some man guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. Verse 32, the place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to slaughter and like a lamb dumb before his shear. So opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the young answered Philip and said, I pray thee, for whom speaketh the prophet this of himself? or of some other man. Then Philip opens his mouth and began at the same scripture. And Jesus preached 
unto him. So understand, most of all, and we talk about this, that um, he came to fulfill the scriptures. He came to fulfill the suffering that was that was promised in the scripture of a Messiah. And he came to do it so that others may be raised or fulfilled. So understand that Jesus came because his father told him to come and understand he's doing the will of his father. He also came to fulfill the uh, promises, the, the words, the scripture of the old prophets. Then we understand another reason that Jesus came. He also came to reveal the father to us. So he came to reveal the father to us. And we can find this in John. So if we flip back just a few pages, John chapter 1 tells us about it. John chapter 1, verse 17 and 18. It tells us. <clears throat> John speaks and it says, For the law was given <clears throat> by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man has seen God at any time. But the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Nobody knows, G knows God better than Jesus Christ. So in order for us to get a closer relationship, in order for us to be revealed to how God works and how God thinks, understand no one knows the Father like the son here. And that's what John is telling us. He was in the father's bosom. He knew the father on a, on a, on an intimate level that we, um, would know what no other man would ever know. Oh, so understand that he comes to earth so you can have, and we can have a different experience. We can have a greater, he can reveal the father to us. Flip over a few pages, John chapter 18, verse 37. It says this, John chapter 18, verse 37, and it says this, Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end I was born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. And understand that he came, people were calling him other things, but he says fundamentally, I came unto the world that I should bear witness unto the truth. And understand God is truth. And so Jesus just reminds him here that he says, I came to one of the things that we talk about, God is truth. Jesus came to reveal the Father, which means he came to reveal the Father's will. And the Father's will is truth. And so he reminds them of that, and he says, everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Those that know me know who I am. Those who desire truth, those who know truth, he says, know that I am the Messiah. He came to reveal the Father to us. Because you have to understand, at that time, the world had become, and the Jewish community had become so twisted, and it was so unjust, and it was so corrupt, that Jesus reminds me, he said, well, you want me to be a king, Messiah, whatever. But he said, fundamentally, understand that I come to reveal the Father to you. And the Father is truth. And he says, if you know and desire truth, then you know who I am. Let's go to Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Once again, I'm going to get some clarity. 5, 17, and it says this. This is Jesus speaking again. He says... Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. 
I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And I know we read this earlier, but understand, he once again, he is letting you know the will of the Father. He's coming to reveal the Father to us. And the reason, you know, like we said before, the reason this is so important is because people at that time had become consumed with these laws. And fundamentally, there's nothing wrong with the laws. But the only problem is no one could fulfill the laws. No man, no common man could do that. And so understand that Jesus did that. And fundamentally, what we understand and what we know about Jesus is and what we know about God is. All he asks is when we do something wrong or if we get it wrong, ask for forgiveness, repent, and that's all he requires. And so understand, but at the time, you know, when you're under the law, when you're totally... The law wants to punish people, beat people down, tear them up. And understand that God says, hey, you know, I, I'm not saying that that law is wrong. Because understand that the, the midst for the 613 laws of, of, of the Jewish culture, they weren't trying to, they were trying to, and the whole idea of the laws, so they were trying to make you, you know, live a more righteous life. So it's nothing wrong with the law. They, they just weren't, weren't coming, you know, the laws weren't crazy. But they were trying to make sure you did not, transgress or did not sin. Well, that we know that's impossible, but that's what the laws are trying to do. So the laws weren't bad, but what God wanted us to understand is don't get so focused and consumed on the laws and condemning people and cutting people down and convicting them. Fundamentally, what God wanted you to do was admit you're wrong, but then ask for forgiveness and repentance. Then let's go to John chapter 12, verse 49, um, 49 and 50. John 12, 49 and 50, it reads on this wise, For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should do. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whosoever I speak, or whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak unto you. Once again, he came to reveal the Father to us. He says, you know, his Father gave him the commandment. He gave him what to say. So he says, if you don't want to know what God has on the issue, if you want to know what God says on the issue, I come to reveal him to you. I come to make it known. Because Jesus was telling them here, whatever the Father says, whatever I say, the Father gave me to say. I'm not just up here winging it. I'm not up here doing my own thing. He says it was given to him by the Father. Last, before we move move on uh, to our last reason that, that God came, let's go to John, back to John chapter 3 and verse 19. It says this, and this, the condemnation, that light is come unto the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And I always go back that, and we know this, the, the Genesis tells us that God created the heaven and earth. And we understand that we go on later, it tells us it was void without form, it was dark. And then he said, let there be light. And understand here that Jesus is talking and he says that light is coming to the world. So understand that Jesus is telling you that the world was a dark place until he came. And understand just like when God created this place that we live on called earth and he created heaven, it was dark. It was void, without structure, without form. And understand before Jesus Christ, that's kind of how the world had gotten. And understand that it was a dark place because the and it says here that men loved darkness because darkness is evil. We love sin. We we take pleasure in it. And until Jesus came, there was no light. And understand that's why he says that here. He says that light is come unto the world. But he understands and he tells us that men love darkness. Understand that the reason that Christ came is to add or to bring light. Lastly, 
or actually not lastly, but the next thing we'll talk about here is that Christ came to save sinners. Um, and we know that uh, if you've been in the church any number of years, we know that Christ uh, not only came to reveal the Father to us, he not only came to uh, fulfill the scripture, but we also know that he came to save sinners. And so let's go to 1 Timothy chapter, um, we'll go to 1 Timothy 1, and we'll go to verse 15, and it says this. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all exceptions. I accept it. That Jesus Christ came unto the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. So Paul is saying this here, and he understands he's he has had an awakening experience. Um, and we understand this is after Jesus has come. But he understands that he knows now. He says, he says, for this is a faithful saying, faithful saying, and worthy to be accepted, pretty much, that Jesus Christ came into this world to save sinners. And he says, for I am the chief sinner. So Paul is writing here. He is letting us know that he has some clarity. But he fundamentally wants us to understand that Christ came to save sinners. Let's go to, back to Matthew really quickly. Matthew uh, chapter 9, verse 12 and 13 reads on this wise. But when Jesus heard that he said unto them, they that be whole need not a physician. We read this before. But they that are sick. But he says this, but go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am not come to call the righteous, but the sinner to repentance. Jesus reminds us here in his own words, not Paul's words now, why he came. He came to save sinners. That was his mission. That was his focus. That was his goal. Flip over a few pages, Matthew 18, 11. Once again, he's being very clear about what he's here for. He says, For the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. He came to save sinners. He came to save those, I myself included, who were lost. Go to John chapter 12, verse 47. John 12, 47, and it says this. It says, And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not, for I come not to judge the world, but to save the world. So understand, and we read other scriptures where he makes it very clear. He says, you know, he told us in the scriptures that if you are someone who desires truth, he says those that desire truth, they know who I am. They understand. They have, we have a, we always say we have an agreement in spirit. And so, you know, it was very clear about that. Jesus here, once again, explaining that. He says, you know, if you don't accept me, if you don't, if you don't, if you don't accept me, if you don't believe in me, he says, I don't judge you. I judge you not. He says, for I come not to judge the world, but to save the world. Hmm. It's Jesus' desire that you be saved. It's not his desire to do that. It's not his desire to make that judgment. Because fundamentally, you understand Jesus, and that's the loving God we serve, God is going to judge. But understand, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, as an advocate for us. Because he understands and knows that when God judges God, as we found out when Jesus was on the cross, when Jesus is on the cross and he says, why hast thou forsaken me? That was the first time in Jesus' life as he takes on the sin of man, that's the first time that he was separated from his father. And so that's why he asked the question, why hast thou forsaken me? 
because that is the first time he's experienced life without his father. And understand, and he, he, we know this, and the Bible speaks of this, that God is a God of purity. That means he can be around no sin. Even when Jesus Christ took on the sin of the world, he separated himself from his, he had to separate, he had to turn away, he had to look away from his son because he had taken on the sin of the world. So understand, Jesus comes as an advocate for us. He came as an advocate. He tried to, his, his whole goal was, he didn't want to judge this world. That wasn't what he was trying to do. He came to save the world because he understood the scriptures. And the scriptures tell us that there is going to be judgment. And if you, it's like any courtroom today, if you go into a courtroom and you stand before a judge, especially if you are on trial for murder, understand because the wages of sin is death. So understand if you're on trial and you go into a courtroom today and you don't have an attorney, actually, most people would, if you go into a courtroom and you are on a, a, a trial for murder and you tell the court you do not want a, a, a lawyer, one of the first things they're going to do is probably test your sanity <laughs> because that is a serious offense. And so you don't want to just be up there just trying to shoot from the hip. You want someone who's been trained and who knows the law. And so Jesus, no different, he understands and knows the scriptures tell us, and we, we know it to be true, is we are all going to have to stand judgment one day. And understand the judge will be no other than your creator, God. And so Jesus comes here to be our advocate. He is our lawyer in the courtroom. But see, if you don't accept him, you have no covering. You have no lawyer. You have no attorney. And so just no different than man's law, I would question the same thing for you. Do you want to stand at judgment with no attorney, with no one arguing your case? And understand that Jesus is your advocate. He is your attorney. He is your comforter. He is your go-between between you and the Father. And so if you don't feel like you need an advocate, if you don't feel like you need an attorney, Understand if Jesus could not look, if God could not look at his own son, Jesus, when he took on the sin of the world, you think he's going to look kindly on you? No, because we are sinful creatures. We're sinful by nature. So Jesus came to save us so that we could have an advocate, so we could have someone who could speak on our behalf. So that's what he was, that's what he came for. That's what he's here for. Lastly, let's go to John. Flip a few pages back. Go to John 3, and we already read this, but we'll read it again, and this is a popular scripture. The only thing we'll read one other verse. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And then verse 14, For God sent not his Son unto the world to condemn the world, but that through the, but, um, that the world through him may be saved. So understand he required, he wanted to save the world. He didn't want to condemn the world. That was not Jesus' role. He wanted to come and save us. A little bit more and, and we will be done. The other thing that Jesus came to die. And understand that we talked about the wages of sin is death. And if you understand Old Testament scripture, that is why whenever someone went to the temple, went to the tabernacle, they had to bring a sacrifice. The word is very clear. The wages of sin is death. When you sin, in order to be forgiven for your sin, something has to lose its life. That's the way God designed it. And so if you don't like that, or you say, well, that seems very harsh, take it up with the Creator. But understand, whether we like it or not, He told us that that was a requirement. So back in the Old Testament days, you had to bring a sheep or you had to bring a cow, or you had to bring a dove, or whatever you had to bring, depending on what your sin was, you understood that that animal had to be slaughtered as a result of your sin. So we know that, but then the scriptures tell us. So let's go to Luke 24, verse 44 through 47, I believe. Luke, 20, Luke 24, 44 
through 47 says this. And I'm going to start reading in 44. It says this, And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and, uh, and in the prophets and in the, the Psalms concerning me. Then open their understanding that they might understand the scripture. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it uh, behooved Christ to suffer, and to raise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. So understand here the scriptures start by telling us what was written? And we understand that the book of Moses tells us, the laws of Moses talk about that something, when you sin, in order for your sin to be forgiven, something had to lose its life. And understand that was the only way that you're, the, the, the shedding of blood is the washing away or the remission of sin. So at that time, they used animals. But understand, Jesus says, I have to come fulfill the scripture. And he says, I became the sacrifice. So he had to shed blood in order to cleanse us because that was the requirement. He tells his disciples that he says, hey, remember the scriptures, something has to die. That something in this case was him. Go to John chapter 12 because he is the only acceptable sacrifice. John chapter 12, verse 27 Jesus speaking once again, he says, Now is my soul troubled, that what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I to this hour. So understand here, Jesus knows he's about to be crucified. And so he asked the question, kind of rhetorically. He says, Now is my soul troubled, that I shall say, Father, save me from this hour. So he says, am I, am I supposed to be so shaken? Am I so shaken that I'm going to pray to my Father, save me from this? But it's a rhetorical question because he answers his own question with the colon, but for this cause I came unto this hour. Jesus is saying this for this call. I came to die. I came to be a sacrifice for you. I came to be your offering. I came to be your burnt offering. I came to be killed so that you might be forgiven. And so he asked that question and then he turns around and answers it by saying, well, am I supposed to cry out to God and ask for it? Father save me from this? But no, I wouldn't ask for that because I came to be this. I came to be the sacrifice. So it would be crazy for me to cry out and ask for the Father to save me. Go to Mark chapter 10, verse 45. And I know you guys are like, man, we're feeling in the scripture a lot. But sometimes you got to read this stuff. You got to understand what the word says. And understand here, this is not about what man says, but it's about what the word says. John, uh, Mark 10, 45, it says, For even the Son of Man came not... To be ministered unto, but to minister. And he gave his life a ransom for many. And we understand if someone has to give a ransom, that means they have to pay a price. And understand when we talk about somebody giving a ransom or paying a ransom, they're doing it usually to save someone's life. And if you pay the right price, you will save a person's life or you will save them from harm. And understand Jesus made it very clear here that he came to be our ransom. He paid our price for us. He came to be a ransom for us because the wages of sin is death. Mm. But understand, he came to be the ransom. He paid the price for us. He paid for our sin. He paid the sin debt because we owe something to God. When we sin, death is the law. It's the rule. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. 
He came to be the ransom. He paid the ransom for us. That's why we get excited about it. Go to Luke chapter 12, verse 15. Luke 12, 12.50, I'm sorry, 12.50. I think I said 15 first. So Luke chapter 12, verse 50. Once again, Jesus talking. He says, but I have a baptism to be baptized with. And how am I uh, straight until it can be accomplished? So he's, he pretty much says, until it is accomplished, understanding that we talk about this baptism and we talk about being baptized, but it's, he, can't, he can't do it until it's accomplished. And the it is talking about there is that he be sacrificed, that he be crucified. So understand, he knows that it has to happen. Lastly, let's go to Luke 24 before we move to our I think last reason that Jesus came. Luke 24, he says this, 6 and 7. He says, um, he is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, the Son of Man must be delivered unto the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. Jesus came on this earth to die. He came to die. Actually, one other thing I want to read here because it just, I think it's such a, a powerful uh, reading is if you go to 1 John and you read 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, once again, very clear here. What was his function? says, herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the, uh, pretty much to say, uh, to, to be the, uh, the result, to be the price to be paid for our sins. So when we talk about what is it, he says, one thing to say, herein is love. Okay, this is love. But then it says, not that we love God, but that he loved us. So it's one thing to all, all, you know, kind of think about the scripture. It's one thing to love a person. But it's another thing for a person to have, when you find out how much a person loves you, it takes on a different meaning. You can love a person, but when you see them do things to show their love for you, it takes on a different meaning meaning or it should take on a different purpose. I know if we're in our own personal relationships, it's one thing for you to love your wife or to love your, your husband or what have you. But when you start stepping back and you see the things that they do because they love you, it makes you have an even deeper love and appreciation for them. And so all the scripture is saying is, yeah, you can love God, but take a step back and say, look how much he loves you. He loves you so much that he gave his son to be, to pay your sin debt. He gave his, he let his son die. He let his son be beaten, crucified, spit on, that you might have the opportunity to eternal life. And so when you start to appreciate, you start to understand that, you say, why do people get so, why do people love God? So why do people love Jesus Christ so much? That's the reason. Not be, it's one thing to love God, but it's another thing to step back and say, well, wait a minute, God, you care so much about me. You, 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 you hold us in such high regard that you would allow, you, you would allow to witness your son be treated that way. You would allow your son to die for us. When you start to really feel that, when you start to really understand that, it changes how you feel about God. It would be no different than if you, it's one thing to have someone you love, whether it be a spouse or a friend, someone you truly, or could even be a sibling, someone you truly love. And all, uh, probably the closest relationship you can have outside of a marriage is that between a child and a parent. And so it's one thing as a child, you love your parents and, 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 and you honor them. That's one thing. But then sometimes you take a step back and you see all the things that they've done for you, all the things that they put in place so that you might be taken care of, whether they were here or not. It changes your admiration. It changes the amount of love and respect you have for them even more. 
And so that's the way we should be about God. When you look at what he's done for us, that he might have a relationship with us, that's what draws us closer to him. Last but not least, Christ came through his death of sin, of a sinner, we, and through his death as a sinner, that we might have a right relationship. And that's kind of where we're moving to. The last reason that you say, well, why did you come here? Why is he here? He wanted us to be able to have a right relationship with our father again. And understand, we talked about it before, God can't be around sin. He can't. He is a perfect God. And so he has to, light and darkness can't reside in the same place. He is light. But understand, we are darkness. So, and what makes us darkness is our sinful nature. So understand, be, before Jesus Christ, you, you, you had no way to, to re regain or re regain right standing with God because of our sinful nature. But Jesus Christ came to try to repair this. So let's look at it very quickly here in, in about four or uh, four or five scriptures and then we'll be done. Let's go to Matthew chapter uh, 10, 40. So Matthew 10, 40. I think we're going to find, um, once again, we're going to find some, some words being shed here or some light being given. Matthew 10, verse 40, Jesus talking. He that receiveth you receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receive him that sent me. So understand, he says here, if you receive me as your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, not only do you get me, but more importantly, you get he who sent me, which is God. Let's go to John chapter 14, verse 6. So John 14, verse 6. Once again, we're going to find Jesus here shedding some insight. Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but through or by me. So understand here that you, you don't, and if it wasn't for Jesus Christ, you could not have a right relation with your father again. You couldn't have a relationship with him. Let's go to uh, Ephesians. Look at Ephesians uh, chapter 2. So let's go to Ephesians 2, verses 16 and 17. So it says here, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross having slain the enmity that, uh, thereby, and come and preached peace to you which were uh, uh, far off, and to them were not. So understand here, the enmity, the bond, whatever broke us, he came to put it back together. And the enmity that we're talking about there is sin. So you can, God and sin can't be in the same place at the same time. So he understands Jesus Christ came to break that enmity. So understand, not that we can ever become 100% sinless. That's not the intent. Understand, but when God looks at us through his son, Jesus Christ, he sees us as he created man from the first start. And we understand here, before the fall of man, man had an had a, a intimate relationship with God. And once we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, it allows us to go back to that original relationship. Let's go quickly to uh, John Chapter 5, verse, um, let's go to John 5, 40 really quick. I think that's what I want. John 5, 40. And it says this, And ye will not come to me that ye might have, ye, uh, ye will come, uh, not, ye will not come to me that ye might have life. And understand here, all it is saying is that if you desire life, you will come to Jesus Christ. Because understand, when we talk about life here, there is no life without the Father. And understand, when we talk about life, we aren't talking about life, our breathing, but we're talking about a spiritual life. We're talking about a spiritual awakening. Um, let's go quickly to uh, 1 John Four. So first John four and we'll go through we'll just read one verse, verse nine. And this was manifested the love of God towards us because that God sent his only begotten Son 
unto the world that we uh, might live through him. So understand he sent his son so we might have life again, spiritual life through him. Last couple of scriptures, John 3. And we know probably we skip over this part because we just like John 3.16. But if you go back to John 3.14 and 15, it says this. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. And understand, God came, I mean, Jesus came, he sent God, or God sent Jesus to give us eternal life again, to, to give us eternal life. And not only did he say give us eternal life, but he allows us then to have a relationship once again with our Father. Last two scriptures, John 6. So flip over a few pages. John 6, and we want to read 51 and 58. John 6, 51 says this. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eateth this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Verse 48. This is that bread which come down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna, but, or manna, sorry, but are, and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. So he says, and he brings us back to the beginning. And when the, when the children of Israel are in the wilderness and they are crying out, they're upset. They're like, Jesus, well, you brought us out here. You got us out of Egypt, but you brought us out here. We're hungry. We're tired. He gave them manna from heaven. So Jesus says, I am your manna from heaven. But the only difference, he says, the manna that, that God gave them, what they needed to sustain themselves. In essence, that's what the manna is. It's what these people need. They're starving. They're hungry for something. They're out in the wilderness. They don't know what to do. They're getting frustrated. So he, gave, he gives them something to uh, preserve them. He gives them something that they need for nourishment. So pretty much Jesus says here, I am your manna from heaven. You're in a world of wickedness. You're in a world of darkness. You're confused. You're becoming frustrated. He says, I am your manna. But he says the only difference is this. They ate a manna, and now they are dead. He says, so that bread, it will sustain you for a short period of time, but it won't take you to eternity. He says, I am the bread, though, that will lead you to eternal life. So you will not die. And so when we understand Jesus came for many different reasons, but the few of them are he came that we might have eternal life. He came that we might have a relationship once again with our father. He came to fulfill the scriptures. He also came to die. And he also came that he might reveal our father to us. If you want to know what God is like, he came that he would do that. You know, we talk about he came to fulfill the scripture and most importantly, he came to do the Father's will. It was the Father's will that we might have eternal life. It was the Father's will that we might be able to have a relationship with him. It was the Father's will, and it is the Father's will, that we live forever with him. And so that is why Jesus came. And that is why uh, I, I talk about that on this day, like I mentioned earlier, the experience with the young lady she just wanted to know why I came. Why are you here? Why are you spending time with us? And so it, oftentimes we need to go back and think. We talk about Jesus, but why did he do what he did? He, do what he, he did what he did because, one, his father told him to do it. But the other thing is he did it for us. And he did it that we might have life and have it more abundantly. And with that, I say God bless you on this day. Enjoy your day. Hopefully... Uh, if nothing else, uh, just going over some of these scriptures, understanding why Jesus came, why we love him so much, and, and understanding how much God loves you. He cares about you. He wants a relationship. He desires a personal relationship with you. And all he asks and desires from us 
is that we take a stance and start moving towards him. God bless you and have a blessed day.